Welcome to another episode of The Local Dive. This is Alex Scott, back from the uh, sickness on the couch. Back in and uh, joined by Ashlyn Portero. Hello. And Jacob Baldry. What's up? Not much. You're rocking the chain today, out of the shirt, looking... <laughs> Nice. Got it. Um, fancy for kids camp. I was going to say, got some, <laughs> got some, some visible flair. Um, <laughs> visible flair. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are without Dean and Sarah. He is on vacation uh, at the moment, but we are excited to finish up our uh, series on the Doctrines of Grace. So today we'll be talking about Perseverance of the Saints, the P in the, the TULIP acronym. Um, and, uh, this podcast is through the summer, a little bit struggled to persevere between <laughs> my sickness, we too are vacation, persevering. um, kids camp We're we're, we're all persevering this week as we, uh, fight through kids camp. It's been a great week, uh, there, but, uh, we're excited to jump into that conversation and talk about, uh, the way that, that God is faithful to finish that, which he begins in us. But before we do, uh, we will talk about some things in the shallow end that we wish, would not persevere or that just mm. weren't really a reality anymore. Something you wish would just fall away forever. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ashlyn, why don't you <laughs> kick it off? What's something you wish would be gone? All right, I've got a couple of things. Um, the first one is I wish that ads on streaming services would go away forever. <laughs> I understand that. They under- can if you pay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes not. I feel like I have maybe... Is, well, there. I think like, them, I, like I think I like for. Hulu. I think Hulu you can pay for, and then you can pay more for no. Oh, ads. maybe that's what it is. So, um, but yeah, I t- I know that like kind of go- goes away with the point of <laughs> like I know the ads are there to make money. But so hey, that- ten dollars a ten dollars a month. I mean, it's like, eh, do I really want to spend that to not watch three minutes of commercials? Exactly. I really could. In all fairness, commercials don't like super bother me, but it would it would also be nice if they weren't there. My problem with, I feel like with streaming services and commercials, granted, I'm only basing this on MLB TV. I get the same commercial like four times in a row. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Gain flings. Like, cool. I'll clean See, my laundry. For me, the problem is that especially HBO Max is really bad about this. They will do like ads that are always really scary movies, like horror movies. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm like just sitting there watching like, you know, a Nora Ephron movie for the 17th time, like you've got mail (laughs) and then like the new Stephen King movie rolls through and I have to like turn the volume all the way down and like think happy thoughts. So (laughs) that's fair that I would like for the ads to go away for that purpose. Um, And then the other one I was going to say is, um, so I do have TSA pre-check now, so let me flex a little bit. Um, But you are willing to pay for that. I am willing to pay for this. um, But just like the, the the security process in general uh, also i'm going to be the annoying person who's like here are my unwarranted thoughts about how this could be better and how it's so annoying even though i like it's not my job at all to there's, oversee there's any a of government this. agency who's thought about this in detail <laughs> exactly and i'm just spouting off my opinions but I, mean, I would say maybe the free market could do it better but that's a whole other discussion yeah, for we, another we will, time <laughs> we will not go there today um taking off your shoes and having to take your computer out of your bag as someone who has done both of those things lots of times and often taking off your shoes without socks so then you end up on a gritty airport floor where other people are barefoot you would think i would have learned that's why i got that's why i got free jack um it's like the ninth time brushing sand off your feet in jacksonville you're like being shamed by everyone around me but the computer thing is really the worst to me because Normally, I'm someone who has my bag packed like perfectly, like I have everything exactly how I want it. And then I have to rip my laptop out and then like things fall together. Your first bag, your second bag, your third bag. Exactly. (laughs) And it just, I'm like, if we have the technology, like if I can like walk through one of the little tube things that like scans like my body through my layers of clothes, I don't understand why my computer can't be in my, you know, tiny purse or something. And pre-check, you don't take it out. And it's the same x-ray machine. Yeah. As So it's like, do they think the people not with pre-check have way sketchier computers? <laughs> and it is annoying. It's like, you can't, and you can't just take it out of the bag. It's got to be in a separate bin. Yeah. So then you've got your bag. You've got your bin for like your You're personal like items. You're everybody up. And then you've got your bin oh, for your first. computer. It's like, this is why, this is why security takes forever. But I mean, at least they're keeping us safe, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. But... Um, my, my one that's like just petty is, um, I wish that 
all restaurants at least gave you the option between Coke and Pepsi. Like the, you know, as a Diet Coke fan, like when I go somewhere and it's just like, we have Pepsi products. I'm like, Womp womp. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll leave. I'll persevere um, through this meal. Yeah, like there's no there's no worse question than is Diet Pepsi okay? No, it's not okay. That's why I asked for Diet Coke. Um, so it's like if gas stations can have options, <laughs> I feel like I feel like restaurants can too. Yeah, if the bodega I, shop can give me like my pick of carbonated beverages. Yeah. Shout out to shout out to Manhattan with the bodega. You know, like well, I'm just thinking or, of like New York. Really, I probably own yeah. those, but. Um, yeah, no, for real. Like Busy Bee has 9 yeah. million options. All I'm asking <laughs> is for like two <laughs> at a restaurant. Like Bojangles, you can have Diet Coke and Pepsi. It's okay. Um, no shade to any listeners yeah. who might prefer their Pepsi, but you're just wrong. I just um, wish that it would go away. Uh, the other thing <laughs> that I think should definitely go away, which, and I saw one of these at Target like three or four days ago. And so it's fresh on my mind is male rompers like they're they're acceptable They've hung on longer than we thought <laughs> they really have they're acceptable if you're like under 12 months old and male yes or agree you're female i i, I don't really know what the appropriate age of like <laughs> female romper wearing is no longer like <laughs> acceptable I, I don't know i will just say i mean and i have had rompers in the past and are like jumpsuits i guess now we've elevated them to jumpsuits jumpsuits um <laughs> are you like ready to, to like dive out of a plane at the moment right notice? i guess a jumpsuit is like pants and a romper is like shorts oh. that's probably the distinction that would be made i think also like i feel like we just started saying jumpsuit because it just like sounds a little better than a romper um but that's fair i so i will say i'll preface this by saying i just like took over your no no <laughs> your you're, come on <laughs> So I just is, clearly this, had some thoughts. There, there's, this is a dialogue. It's, you know, it's a podcast. <laughs> Come on. I, so I have worn them. So I'm, I'm giving that caveat. But I have never heard of like a male opinion that is positive <laughs> towards rompers. Like I, as a female, I feel like it's one of those things that men look at and they're like, why do women like rompers? Like nobody thinks that rompers are great, but like we just, women persevere in wearing them. We're like, we need well, the onesie. So like, I haven't really thought about this till now, but it sort of seems like a, maybe like a safer dress. <laughs> like, yeah. like it's a dress you can wear in windy conditions <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> Because, like, yeah. you know, it's still all one piece. You don't have to make a decision on, like, does the top match the pants <laughs> right. or the, the skirt or the whatever. You know, it's just like, all one. it's all one. So it seems sort of efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe that's a, yeah, a selling point. I can see that. I don't know. Um, I will say, though, here's my controversial hot take. And I'm probably about to insult the entire female population as a woman. So I don't know how, how I got but here. But you're a woman, so it's okay. <laughs> you, have the, you have the card. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I wonder if men, just hear me out here. I'm not advocating for men to wear rompers. Depending on the style of the romper, because, you know, now like there's like the more utility ones that are kind of more like corduroy denim, like they're a little more substantial as opposed to just like these cotton, like kind of light rompers so that, that's are, like Britney Spears that are like a dress but shorts to your point. Um, yeah. Oh God. Wow, Justin, I need to send process that for a minute. Justin Timberlake in the, the denim cowboy Yeah, hat. maybe. Like, <laughs> I wonder if men are like more naturally built for rompers than women. I just feel uh, like okay. there's a lot that can go wrong with a woman in a romper. And not that that's not true for men. This is so bad. But I'm just thinking there are a lot of awkward positionings that... Depending on the style, it's yeah. It like seems men like, generally are more like square bodies, like you know what I'm saying, like the frame. Yes, yes. I, I, there, there is. <laughs> How many lines have I crossed at this point? <laughs> there does seem like maybe there's less that could go wrong depending on the style. However, I feel like there are uh, to, to 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 combat your your. Um, like I'll say one. I think it's just generally way more acceptable for women to wear them. Yes. Like without severe judgment. Like a romper feels like something Harry Styles would wear on the cover of Vanity oh, Fair. For sure. And there's a lot of problems with anything that Harry Styles would wear on the cover of Vanity <laughs> Fair, aka a dress. So like I'm that's my judgment there. But um the the thing I was gonna say there's I feel like there's two types of guys who can pull off a romper. 
And typically they're the same two types of people who can pull off another questionable male um, uh, clothing piece. And that would be the Speedo. <laughs> so like oh there's <laughs> there's the guy who's, either, us, who's either really fit, like who can pull off the romper because it just like it fits it's correctly like you can pull off it lays anything. right yeah it's like it lays right. uh, <laughs> so yes well you know <laughs> and then there's the so that's also the same guy who can if there is such thing as pulling off a speedo like it's guy who's really fit um, he's like in a cool water you know commercial or whatever <laughs> in the middle of your streaming yeah, like service maybe you're a professional swimmer um, who are we to judge or it's the guy who's like jack built like jack black <laughs> so like <laughs> He's he's definitely not skinny, um, but he's not like super fat, obese. I don't know what's the I don't, I'm like way we've we've already crossed <laughs> like politically correct. Are the saints but, persevering? <laughs> I don't know. Not from this. <laughs> <laughs> this is certainly not edifying, but it's true. It's where we're at. So I feel like uh, that like those two guys. It's like it's the guy who you're like, wow, what? Okay, you're going there. All right. Like you can have a good um, laugh. Yeah. So like those are the two guys that I would say maybe would would pull off but okay. but that's probably because if you're confident enough to pull off a speedo you're confident enough to pull off anything confidence is definitely and key so that's in the probably for, for either gender yeah, i would say yeah so if you're feeling it get your romper if you're normal <laughs> and you're not <laughs> don't but they should go away um speedos oh probably my. should go away too like what's yeah. wrong with the swimmy shorts like yeah just, at this point we like, are they necessary yeah we know you europeans like you know want to bathe that way but no not not acceptable here in america um all right now that we've now we've every line yep i was gonna say now that we've gotten (laughs) real shallow uh let's dive into uh the topic of perseverance of the saints uh and finish up uh tulip and uh by god's grace he's the one that does all the work in this and (laughs) and sustains us and keeps us uh so Ashlyn, will you maybe set up uh this idea and this this doctrine of perseverance of the saints what are we talking about yeah well i would say like like we've been saying all along these doctrines kind of all work together so um I would say perseverance of the saints, you know, kind of flows out of the same sovereignty and providence and and mercy of God that we would say, um, you know, unconditional election does, um, even total depravity. I mean, Mm -hmm. knowing that there's nothing that we bring to our salvation, that it's all a gift of of God's grace and God's um, ordaining us for that, um, that, that in that there's also the knowledge that he's going to keep us unto the end and that again that's not going to be by our works uh, so even as we're sanctified uh, and and we're redeemed and we're renewed day by day and formed into um, ultimately you know the the image of Christ that that's all happening by the work of the spirit uh, for our good and for God's glory but it's not something that we earn uh, we're, we're active in it like we participate in our sanctification obviously mm-hmm. but but that's all happening by the Holy Spirit working in us and so um, just the great comfort that uh, if, if God truly has opened our eyes to who he is and, and what he has done for us in Christ and, and we trust in Christ as Savior, that, um, that, that we can't lose our salvation. We can't fall away from, from God if we are God's elect. Um, that you know, our, what, what we possess um, in Christ, and I, I'll have to look it up, but there's the quote that says uh, what we, um, oh gosh, now I'm going to butcher it, uh, what we've been saved to, we've also been saved for, I think maybe, or. I think that's right. It's, I'm, that's, I kind of got that wrong. Let me, let me do a quick Google. I should have had that pulled up. Um, but, but basically that, that God will preserve us for the inheritance that we're going to receive in Christ. And, um, and so, you know, that, that I think kind of summarizes perseverance of the saints. Would you add anything to that? Yeah. I think one of the things that, um, and, and you, you mentioned this, that, I think is just important to stress in this conversation is in the same way that we don't, um, yeah, I like the connection that you made to kind of the other, the other doctrines, but with total depravity, um, and unconditional election, we like, we don't bring anything to our salvation and it's ultimately not our works that sustain us, uh, that, that get us to the finish line. It's, um, Jesus and in his work and then the spirit that sustains us by the grace of the father that allows us to to persevere to the end um, 
because it, uh, it's the same in this in the sense that he's the one doing the saving he's elected us and uh, if it was up to me I'd lose it you know but um, the fact that the, the father is is good and kind and holds us and does the work in us that um, it, it actually re- removes a lot of the burden on that sort of performance faith mm. uh, to, to allow us to say no it's like yes there is I mean you know, James says faith without works is dead. So it doesn't mean that we aren't, um, that we aren't doing good works that we're not, you know, we don't just go, I prayed a prayer. Sweet. I'm going to go just be crazy. God's got this like persevere until the end. Um, but that it is the Lord that sustains the work that actually he's the one who holds us in his hand. It's not Mm -hmm. up to us. I just think is, is an important piece in, uh, this idea of perseverance of the saints. And something you just said, I think that's a really good, like kind of little point to hit on is, if we do think of, um, you know, I, I prayed the prayer and, and now I'm good and, and God keeps me to the end. Even there, we're looking at the substance or the basis of our faith as works, right? Mm-hmm. Like I prayed a prayer, yeah. you know, I, and I'm sure people, you know, mean, mean more than that. But, but if that really is functionally how we're living, um, then, you know, that's not saving faith. Saving faith is, calls you to, um, to much more than that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I just, I thought that was a good little point. Um, the, the quote that I absolutely butchered <laughs> beforehand. Is, it's, oh, well, it's, I was like, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> it's um, from Richard Sibbs. It says an inheritance is not only kept for us, but we are kept for it. And so mm-hmm. yeah, kind of this idea that um, we are, you know, as, as we persevere by the grace of God, um, you know, he's, he's preserving us and, and thankfully re- renewing us for, you know, eternity with him. Yeah, one of the things that as we as we kind of frame this idea that it's the Lord that keeps us and and sustains us, I think one of the first questions that probably comes to I mean it comes to mind for me. I'm guessing it comes to mind for others is the idea that um, you know oftentimes we know people who make a profession of faith and then they either um, turn away and you know maybe end up you know to as the the popular term right now deconstruct their faith or, you know, kind of become, you know, outright atheist, agnostic, whatever, you know, they, they, they no longer believe the things that they once professed. Um, how do we think about, uh, that idea that there are people who can make professions of faith, um, and then at the same time may or may not be elect, obviously just because somebody in the moment is saying, I no longer believe these things doesn't necessarily mean that their faith wasn't legit at that time they weren't, you know, that they're in sin now and that they may not come, you know, they may come back to the Lord, but, but, but how do we reconcile the fact that there may be people who make legitimate proclamations of faith? I say legitimate, like, I mean, uh, you know, they make a proclamation of faith, but then they end up, end up leaving the faith. How do we, how do we think about that with this doctrine? Yeah. I mean, gosh, there are people much smarter and more studied than I, than I am who could, you know, kind of mine the depths of those questions. So I will say from my limited understanding um, and as I, you know, continue to to grow in these doctrines and sort of my grasp of them and um, testing them with the scriptures, which is, you know, of course ha- has to happen. Um, I mean, we, as kind of when we were talking about election and that week, you know, we, I don't know someone's heart and, and, and I'm not God. So, so I think we have to start there saying, mm-hmm. I don't know what the course of someone's life is, is going to be or what, you know, how that's going to go. Um, so I would say if for the Christian who is, gosh, it's such a painful place to be watching someone who, you know, maybe I have, you know, people very close to me that this is true of you, you know, at one point in time, seems to have a very genuine faith and now are not walking with the Lord. Mm-hmm. That can, that's a really, you know, painful, difficult place to be. Um, I think it has to start, f- we have to approach from a place of hope. You know, I, I, and, and not in that person's like ability to get themselves together, but in God's sovereignty, that if he truly has called that person, that they will come back. Mm-hmm. Um, if to your point earlier, if that faith was never genuine to begin with, well then, we've got to continue to share the gospel and, and to point to the truth of God, to the truth of Christ um, in the hopes that, that those seeds maybe that have been planted will actually take root and, and that true faith and fruit will sprout up. Um, and so, 
you know, I think that's, um, t- to me, I think that that's kind of the starting place. Um, I was reading an article on the Gospel Coalition, and this is, um, you know, it's not always helpful to like dwell in the current events, but sometimes it can be helpful to shed light on things. I was reading about, you know, we're in a time where you hear more and more about, especially if you're like on Twitter and social media and things like that, about Christians deconstructing their faith. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to say that, you know, I, I think we always should, and you know, examine our faith and, and test, you know, test ourselves. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, we want to make sure that we're not just kind of going through the motions and there might be, you know, painful uh, things from your childhood or, or there might be any number of things that now like, bear some kind of weight you know in in your walk with the lord that that you've got to kind of work through and and i hope that people work through that with with god and 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 entrust ourselves to him and to the scriptures um but anyways there's there's a lot of deconstructing happening for a lot of different reasons i think each person walking through that has you know a different story to tell so i i don't think we should make sweeping statements about things always but anyways (laughs) that big lead up to say i was reading um an article written by Kevin DeYoung and I think in collaboration with a couple of others about Joshua Harris, who's a, you know, kind of more well-known Christian who, Mm -hmm. um, he wrote the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And, uh, I think at one point when we talked about maybe purity culture, his name came up, but anyways, he's, you know, kind of as he, in his words, deconstructed his faith and no longer considers himself a Christian. And, um, I was just reading, you know, this, it was interesting to read this article written by some of his friends who have walked with him in this and had these conversations and said, we're, we're watching our friend, effectively walk away from the truth that we've all shared and um, and loved uh, and and that can be very hard and so I just wanted to um, to read this I, I thought that Kevin DeYoung said it well and so why don't I let him <laughs> him say it and not me but um, he says while we grieve Josh's decision and have told him as much we are not without hope and we've told him that as well we will continue to call on the God of sovereign mercy the God Josh once extolled and the God who still sits on the throne We pray for our friend, for our churches, and for ourselves, that we may keep ourselves in the love of God. So that's citing Jude 21, Mm -hmm. as God keeps us from stumbling. Um, Jude verse 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Um, And so I guess I think we have to come at these situations with a lot of humility to say it's not for me to and I need to be like aware and present and and care about the state of my friends or family members faith Mm -hmm. um but we can't know what the outcome is going to be but we can hope in a great God who has promised that uh his his saints will not fall away um let me uh pull up the Psalms here, um, Psalms 30, Psalm 37, 28, for the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. And so there is this sobering reality, but there's also the hope that, uh, whom God calls, he preserves Mm -hmm. and, and they persevere until the end. And that's by God's justice and his mercy. We see that working together. So, yeah, I think, you know, to, in, in that idea that people may make a public profession of faith and then end up, you know, walking away from it or repudiating it. Um, there, there are a couple things and and it all ties back to other things that we've talked about with unconditional election and, you know, limited atonement or particular redemption to use, uh, another term. But as as we got to, you know, to that point, like the, the idea that, um, there are people that the Lord, for whatever reason, in his sovereignty and in his, you know, all knowing wisdom and knowledge chooses not to save. Um, and so it, it shouldn't in some ways it should, it should grieve us, but it shouldn't surprise us maybe as a way to think about that when people do, um, you know, tur- turn away from the faith. And I just, I mean, a couple things that come to mind is Romans nine, um, you know, where Paul in this is, is quoting, God talking to Moses saying, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Like yeah. that's hard for us to, to grasp in sort of our human understanding. Like when we tend to think that we're generally good people or that the people that we know are, are good people. I mean, you know, one that's one of the things that, 
Melissa and I were talking about um, recently where uh, she has a friend who is a coworker who would, I mean, claim to, I think be ag- agnostic or atheist, mm-hmm. one or the other, but um, is so from like a social good perspective does so much good um, that it's, you know, it, it's one of those things where she's like, I think she does more for other people than a lot of believers. And it's hard to think in that moment, like this this person is, Mm -hmm. you know, destined potentially um, to, you know, an eternity apart from God. And, and so, uh, but we have to rest in the fact that like, it's the Lord's choosing and it's his, Mm -hmm. his wisdom and his knowledge. And it doesn't mean that this woman can't come to know the truth of, of, the scriptures and who God is and what he's done for uh, us. But, but like there are people that for whatever reason that God is going to harden their hearts and we, we have to be okay with that. But to your point, I think like we also need to pray earnestly, continue to share the gospel, hope that that's not true, but, but also rest in the fact that like we aren't God. And so we don't know um, necessarily, you know, what that's going to be. And I, I mean, first John says this as well. First John two nineteen. he says they went out from us, but they did not belong to us for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. Like, mm. like Christ is going to hold his people. Um, you know, Jesus, even at the end of the sermon on the Mount says, you know, basically, you know, they're going to, people are going to come up to him at the last day and say, didn't we do many works in your names? Didn't we prophesy in your name? He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Um, like those are, those are, serious words um yeah. that that all should cause all of us introspection but at the same time we should be able to rest um in the finished work, work of christ and so it shouldn't i, I guess I sh- it shouldn't surprise us when there are people who um, make a make a profession and then end up i don't know falling away is the right term yeah. you know but uh, but i think it, it should also cause us to examine you know uh, examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith, um, to make sure that, you know, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not that it's us, but mm-hmm. that, that, that there would be evident fruit, evident works, um, as, as proof that God is the one who is sustaining us and who is, is doing the work, um, on a, on a similar maybe point, obviously there are people who, who do just fall away. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other people who are like the prodigal son who, um, you know, le- you know, uh, leave, go live in sin, oftentimes serious sin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think David is a good example of this. You know, the scriptures call him a man after God's own heart. Um, he clearly, uh, is, you know, I would say is a believer, um, trusts in the God of the scriptures. Um, but as we know, commits incredibly serious sin. Uh, so how do we think about that idea with, um, the way that that sin affects the believer, um, and the fact that people can be in um, serious sin, but also are at the same time preserved by the Lord, and uh, we don't always know those things either. How do we how do we kind of wrestle and grapple with that? And maybe it's sin in our own lives to go, oh, well, like how how can I be preserved when this is true in me? Yeah, well, I would say we do have to acknowledge that we will be held accountable for the actions that we, you know, do and and perform in these bodies. Um, And so we do need to take sin seriously as believers. Um, To your point earlier, it's not, um, and and to, you know, call on Paul, you know, it it doesn't mean that uh, because we now are, you know, under the law of grace that we're able to do whatever we want. Um, In fact, we're, we are to, you know, offer ourselves as living sacrifices and to pursue holiness and, and to live in the new um, the new that we've, you know, been been made into. We're new creations. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Um, so I think that, um, you know, we, if, it, if it's, like, if, it, if this is, if you're thinking about this in the context of yourself, you know, if you're maybe someone who um, has professed faith in Christ and, um, and, and believes, you know, in salvation by the blood of Christ alone, um, but have, you know, fallen away into sin or have just found yourself in repeated sin patterns, um, I, I would take great encouragement that, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Mm-hmm. And and so there's, you know, I mean, again, Paul, where we're sin increased, uh, grace increased all the more. And so um, there's great forgiveness in um, confessing sin, repenting, and turning back to God that, that, 
Um, if we're in Christ, he's never not ready to receive us, you know, and that's just such a comfort. I mean, that's a comfort to me every day that mm-hmm. I wake up and the Lord is ready again. You know, he's, he's never stopped loving me. He's, he's there again to receive us as his children and, and we can always come to him. And so um, I think maybe that's something that, you know, in the, in like a gospel culture is, is so evident, but, but in day-to-day life is not there, you know? And so mm-hmm. I think that's something as Christians, we've got to be reminded of again and again, that, that literally the Christian life is, is repenting and coming back to God again and again and again. And, and that's again, only because of like his goodness and, and the power of the spirit at work in us, mm-hmm. applying our salvation to us. Um, so, I mean, those are just, uh, those are just a few thoughts. Um, but I mean, but we also, we look at, you know, the truth of the scriptures and I mean, Psalm 31, love the Lord, all you, his saints, the Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. And so I think there's got to be this, um, we've got to believe that sin is real and that there's, that, that we're under the wrath of God if we persist in that, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, we, we've got to, to hate sin. I mean, be, I think it was John Owen, right? Be, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. Um, and, um, and I think that's true. And so sometimes, you know, we find ourselves in a place where it doesn't seem like sin is killing us, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that's a, that's got to be the scariest place to be. Um, I had a, I was just in a conversation with somebody about this the other day, kind of on a, a different topic, but, um, we were, we were talking sort of about that and, kind of like this persisting in rebellion. And um, I had a seminary professor who said that, you know, when we look at Genesis 3 in the fall, when, when Adam and Eve, you know, hide from God mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and he's, of course he knows where they are, but he's, you know, saying, where have you gone or, or where are you? Um, my, my professor said that's, to him, that's like the saddest part of the Bible is, is that immediately in that fall that ma- then man's default is to hide from God, you mm-hmm. know, to, to like remove from God's presence. Um, and so that I'm kind of like now drifting, but, but all of that to say, when we think about, um, you know, someone who's been in the faith and then, you know, kind of falls away into sin or, or like is, and I don't mean just like you sin, like, but you know, have like walking in a way of rebellion, I guess, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, there, there's great mercy. Like you said, the prodigal son, that's the best example of, um, you know, being welcomed back in. And I think that's, that's a responsibility for the church too like we need to have great compassion for people who have fallen away from the faith and and yes of course there are consequences for sin mm-hmm. um it doesn't mean that um you know you as the, the the person who's fallen away gets to like determine the terms of <laughs> restoration or reconciliation like we have to there's got to be great humility all around mm-hmm. but if the church really is a family and we really are sons and daughters of god um, then, then we need to have deep burdens for our siblings of the faith who have walked away. Be, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, like in, in that the way that we would hope for grace and, and deep down, you know, maybe under our pride would, would always want to be welcomed back in, you know, mm-hmm. like not this tendency to, well, I have to earn your way back in or, you know, oh, they're never actually going to believe me again. You know, no, none of that. That's mm-hmm. not the gospel. And so... Yeah. Um, anyways, those are ramblings, but, um, but I think there's a great responsibility on the church as well to care enough about our brothers and sisters. And then of course, even those who are, have never been in the faith and are far from God, um, to, to, to bring people in. That's, that's what, you know, Christ left the 99 to find the one. And Mm -hmm. that's what we're called to do too, I think. Yeah. I think there's some, some things kind of coming off some of what you said that I would just add to that is one, when the Christian falls even in incredibly serious sin they never fall so far that they're out of god's grace um and so um not that doesn't you know minimize consequences of you know earthly consequences of sin um but the lord is still holding them no matter how far uh they've run and upon you know that repentance they are welcomed back into um you know into the kind of the the loving grace of of the father um at the same time, the, the, the church has the responsibility to care for them in their sin. Um, and what that often looks like is, you know, church discipline. Um, and the scripture lays out, you know, essentially from, hey, I'm going to go to a brother and, and talk to them about something I see in their life. I'm going to point out this sin and I'm going to have a conversation if um, that doesn't 
you know, affect change. If, you know, then I'm going to bring another, I'm going to bring a second person with me. And then it, you know, ultimately goes up to excommunication of the church, which I think we see in this example in first Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians five. Um, you know, we have this clear example of uh, a guy who's in, um, you know, pretty serious sin. Uh, and the church is kind of casual about it. And Paul's writing and was like, no, like send him out for the sake of him being cut off from Christian community so that he would repent and return to you. And then in second Corinthians, you know, he's writing and it would appear that this individual has, because of being sent, you know, kind of cut off from the church and from the sacraments from the Lord's supper, um, that, uh, that, he, he returns and then they are, you know, actually you're talking about, it's the responsibility of the church to, you know, open, like open your arms in grace to that person. Um, like they don't do that very well. And so then right. Paul writes and goes, no, no, no. Like the Lord has forgiven them. You too need to forgive them and love them and bring them back into the fold. And so I, I think that's just a, a helpful example, um, you know, in that for us. And then, uh, the other thing that came to mind as, as you were talking was, um, the Lord's forgiveness in, in Psalm 103. Um, and you know, so there, this, I would encourage anyone who just even, you know, all of us sin. Um, so regardless of whether you're, you know, deep in sin or just in kind of daily battles with sin to go read Psalm 103 and be reminded of the goodness and the graciousness of our God and the way that he deals with our sin. Ultimately he did it, uh, you know, with, with Christ on the cross, taking them in our place. But, you know, when we repent, it says for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the East is from the West, so far has he removed our transgressions from us as a father has compassion on the, on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Um, and that's just like encouraging that, you know, like when, when, our, you know, in, when we are in Christ, when we are kept by the spirit that our, our transgressions could not be, further removed from us. Like the Lord does not uh, keep that record of wrongs because Christ's blood has covered it. And so uh, that's just, as we think about this, this topic and wrestle with this, that it, it, you know, it can be difficult sometimes to believe that like, oh, the the Lord is going to preserve me. He is forgiven me. You know, he has forgiven me. He is forgiving me. He will continue to forgive me until the end of time, until he, you know, completes the good work that he has started in me. Um, that, that, you know, we can be reminded by his word and by his truth that these things are, are realities for those who are in Christ Jesus is just really, really helpful. Um, one of the other things that, that came to mind in this conversation is oftentimes people who are, uh, maybe most hesitant towards the doctrines of grace have a, have a great time like with this one, you know, like there's no problem. Uh, everybody, like it's sort of like everybody believes perseverance of the saints. And I think, you know, Dean, obviously if he was here would probably talk quite a bit about this with the idea of cultural Christianity and, you know, grandma like knows little Johnny prayed a prayer when he was, you know, seven years old and yeah, he's, there's no fruit. Um, but you know, like, why do you think that, um, maybe we struggle so much with, the other uh, kind of aspects of, you know, and not that necessarily somebody has to hold all five, five points of Calvinism, you know, air quotes, but um, is it just that we want people to be saved? And so we think they are, or, you know, why is that the one that people hold on to so easily? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of different reasons, but you know, I, I think people, even Christians grapple with the reality that, you know, God is wrathful, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, in his justice, but, um, it, that's hard for, I I think a lot of it boils down to just like, it's hard for our human limited fallen minds to fathom, you know, who, um, we, we, we can't, I mean, we, we can search out the depths of God, but we don't know them Mm -hmm. all. And so, um, I think, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things that are difficult for us to grasp, but I will say to sort of challenge this doctrine, I, I think, um, second Timothy four or second Timothy, I guess is, kind of a helpful place to look for me um, because so Paul is writing like towards the end of his life and he's in prison in Rome and um, he's like in terrible conditions and he's writing to Timothy and he's basically like you know bring these people to me bring you know my books bring kind of these different things and and especially if you read second Timothy 4 it's like reading as like last words you know there's Mm -hmm. personal instructions in there and he's just kind of reflecting on his journey and his ministry and so there's kind of to me this like sobering heavy tone uh to or or sentiment to his writings 
And um, in 2 Timothy 4, uh, starting in verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I think that could be a place, and I, you know, you sometimes hear that verse, like it may be like at a funeral or like if, I remember seeing it in like, like yearbook, like my graduation yearbook, you know, like you, <laughs> you kept the faith through 12th grade and it's like, and now you're about to go to college. And, and just 80% <laughs> of you are probably not going to keep the faith right. there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not like laughing actually about that. It's not funny, no. but you know, it's just kind of ironic, ironic that, you know, this is how we misuse verses, but, um, but, you know, but somebody like in good faith might might read that and say, well, I mean, Paul's kind of, you know, kind of sounds like he's like giving himself a little pat on the back, you know, like I've I've hung on like in the you know the midst of all these people falling away and all these false teachers mm. and all, you know, the days are evil and da, 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 like I have finished the race. I kept the faith like but but he's not he's not speaking or writing, you know, pridefully there. Um, and, and in fact, in verse eight. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so even, you know, he, he's looking to the Lord as the judge, as the one who will award the crown of righteousness to be worn for all eternity. Um, and, and even a chapter before, you know, he's, telling people that you know in in these last days like there's going to be terrible times and people are going to fall away and they're going to love things besides god Mm -hmm. and he's giving all of these um you know kind of all of these instructions and and he tells them you know go back to uh where is it in verse verse 15 he says you know how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which what a gift if if that is you Mm -hmm. um you know as as these people as he's speaking to these people, you know, which are the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. And so I think like just kind of reading, I mean, that's surface level, but just like even reading a little bit of second Timothy and kind of seeing how some of this language, you know, when we might say like, keep the faith or, you know, and, and we just kind of usually mean that as like an encouragement, like hang yeah. on, you know, or whatever that Endure. means. Endure. Yeah. Um, but, but even Paul in, if we look at the words, of course, of like our translation that he's using, that it's, the meaning is suggesting that he's saying, hang on to these things of the faith that you have. And it's these things that are pointing you to Christ, mm. pointing you to the father, um, that the, the scriptures make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. So it's always like pointing away from us. Mm. Um, and so I think that is I don't know. To me, that's kind of like a helpful place to look. Um, I know that like is not even what you ask most people. You know, we just sort of like the idea of like being kept, you know, and, and we yeah. are. Oh, gosh, praise the Lord for mm-hmm. that. Um, I, you know, I mean, just in this conversation, if we could lose our salvation, I think we would have. Yeah, definitely <laughs> in the shallow end. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just salvation is floating somewhere in the shallow end. Um, but, you know, but just to kind of like parse through even these um aspects of this doctrine that um i i could i could even sympathize with someone who is like challenged a little bit even in that you know of like yeah but if we're if we participate in our sanctification meaning that like you know it's like yeah but but it's all (laughs) it's not to our glory it's it's to god's and Mm -hmm. and it's not even by our works it's by the power of the holy spirit um and so very humbling but also just so encouraging um that you know as as Paul is saying, I mean, he, we're going, we're going to be kept to the end, even through the, you know, the last days, even, even through these, Mm -hmm. these times where the world is turning away from the truth. Um, and, um, I mean, as he says in verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Um, and that's just, I think, true for all of us as well and we we saw god's faithfulness on paul's life we read that through the scriptures and we know that we too have that um in christ yeah i think like oftentimes too in this idea that um we we have a tendency to sort of rest and rest in a you know a proclamation and then just go ah they're 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 safe like they're you know they're fine they're gonna be okay um they're gonna they're gonna return like i just you know it, it, I think it is based sort of on oftentimes the like the hope that they have for themselves, you know, like if it is, you know, a, a parent or a grandparent or something or, or like a friend, like 
it, I think it's based out of belief in God's persevering work um, and a desire for them to know that that is true. Um, but I think sometimes like where we have it, maybe have a tendency to rest on our laurels there is that like we, we do have a responsibility to, even if we think that they are saved, to continue to have conversations, to continue to evangelize, to continue to challenge, to press, to, Absolutely. to, to, in a sense of like first Corinthians to sort of cut off when, when that's not, you know, when what they claim to be uh, saying and what they're doing don't live up to the reality. But I think it is sort of based on this idea that like there is a, de- like there's a desire for what they believe to be true about themselves, having, you know, hopefully a genuine faith to be true uh, about, about others around them. And it, I think what you were saying about um, second Timothy is just really interesting too, because what, precedes verse you know verses six seven and eight is is paul encouraging timothy to continue the ministry that he's had and that the like you know in in verse three a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears that they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and then he's like as for you be sober-minded endure Mm -hmm. suffering do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry and i think those like that was just an interesting comparison as I was thinking about, okay, like oftentimes, I mean, not, not like, you know, the grandparents and the, the parents of the faith are the, are the, um, are, are Timothy, but Paul's encouragement to Timothy can be encouragement to us when we see others who, you know, like, it's like, no, continue to fulfill the work of this ministry, whether that's to your family or to a church or to, you know, if you're you know, just w- wherever the Lord has placed you for opportunities in ministry, in the workplace, um, in your, you know, your home, whatever that is, like, there's going to be a time where people are going to entertain other things, mm-hmm. but this hope that you have continue to press it and, you know, can continue to believe it. Mm-hmm. The Lord, because he's kind and has given you the spirit will allow you to mm-hmm. and uh, like press it into others so that he might save them. I just thought that was an interesting comparison as he's at the end of his, yeah, at the end good. of his ministry and like that desire to see others saved, but then to say, no, no, like we have a responsibility in that to continue to continue to encourage them to, to trust in, uh, in the Lord. And so that's, That's um, yeah. So the, the, the last, I guess, maybe question or, or thought on this is, um, what, what hope does this doctrine give you, uh, as a believer? Oh man, (laughs) hope that I'm going to make it to the (laughs) end. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as you grow, as a Christian, you just become more and more aware of your sin and even of like the sin that you're not aware of, you know what I mean? Um, and like, I just become more and more aware of like how much capacity for sin there is in me that sometimes I'm not even attuned to. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so it just hope, like hope that, you know, when it sort of feels like you just start, not doing great things for God or, or you're discouraged or it's like, gosh, the world like weighs so heavy on me. It's like none of these things can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And so I think it's, um, hope. And then also, I mean, really truly power to, to discover anew what you have in the gospel, like the treasure that that is and that, that doesn't ever, run out or dry up or get old um it, it's always there like the treasure you know that that the inheritance that we're going to receive like we get even now like in in the way that we are able to um be you know brought into communion with god and we get to enjoy that even here um and then we'll know it in full one day but so yeah just that um and for me like as someone who i'm you know like performance minded I can you know I'm like self-motivated to like want to be you know like want to do it you know want to be good at things want to achieve like achiever mentality um I'm an Enneagram three even though like I don't that's not like my identity but just like you know if that resonates with you yeah whatever um you know all that kind of stuff like that it also like kind of like chafes against my pride Mm -hmm. you know of like it's not me like it's not me keeping me here it's God and that humbles me 
but it also comforts me when I can be honest with myself and say like you don't have it in you to preserve yourself to the end um, but but God does because he's chosen you and he's going to keep you um, and and you have you know this treasure stored up for you mm-hmm. and so um, yeah I could go on and on but those are a few thoughts yeah I think th- for me it rests all of this this all of the doctrines of God's salvation is I, I find great confidence in believing that it's not in anything in me but it's in God and his grace and his sovereignty that I will be preserved it's the spirit's work because of the son's obedience and the father's goodwill um, and what what came to mind as sort of like a, a closing thought for me is um, Hebrews 7 you know 25 says therefore he being Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them like there is no greater hope for me than the fact that Jesus is interceding on my behalf uh, always when I when I think about it, when I don't, um, and that's true, that's true for any who are in him. Um, and you know, I, I, like Hebrews seven is, well, Hebrews in general is full of just beautiful gospel goodness that, um, is, you know, wonderful to, to be read, to read and to be reminded of. But, um, I just that idea that it's God who does the work, you know, the, the end of chapter seven says for the law appoints as high priests, men who are weak. But the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Um, and it's like, that's what I want my hope to be in. Not me, not my works, not my ability to get there, even though like I want to achieve and I mm-hmm. want to get there. Um, like clearly from the first 15 minutes of this podcast, I ain't getting there on my own. <laughs> like, you know, I'm more worried about male rompers than I am like, you know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, than, than, than the goodness of God. Um, and so... It would be that would kind of be the the closing thought, and then the other thing that as I was thinking about this was Psalm twenty three, um, which again is kind of classic, you know, uh, funeral passage. But as David is writing, um, it's interesting, like all of the 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 context is on what God does, mm-hmm. um, and so that would just be the things that that I rest my hope in is that it's God who does the work in us. And thank God it has, I don't want to say nothing to do with what I do, uh, but but that it's, that it's God who does the saving, who does the sustaining, and who will ultimately, you know, glorify me uh, in whenever the day comes. Yeah. So That's those good. are... Those are my final thoughts. Um, as we <laughs> transition to a slightly lighter topic, um, <laughs> what are some things locally, local on tap, uh, that you would either... <laughs> like to see preserved or are curious how they are preserved <laughs> or persevere in in Tallahassee uh, especially in the tough times we face post covid uh, what are, what do you got locally that um i'm a faithful follower of cool beans cafe on facebook and mm. i'm just so glad that they continue to persevere <laughs> If yes. you're someone who's like a great restaurant worker, you should go apply to work at Cool Beans because I need them to stay open for my own personal enjoyment of life. Um, on the very food flip side, food too. oh gosh, yeah, preserve our local restaurants. Like yes. let them let them persevere till the end. Yes. Um, on the flip side of that, how Chuck E. Cheese has hung on after all this time as someone who has lived in Tallahassee on and off since basically birth. Yeah. The Chuck E. Cheese on North Monroe is the one that, like, I think my sister turned five there and had her party. Like, it's, you know, we have gone through the decades. It has survived. I the mean, animatronics times are still of the war, same. <laughs> multiple presidencies, a global pandemic. A, a, a recession. A recession. Like, I mean, just cultural upheaval. <laughs> and Chuck E. Cheese is just still there doing its thing. Like, so... It's got to be like a front. Like there's something happening. <laughs> like you think something shady's happening? Like there? like it's like the money laundering, uh, like business oh. for something. That's my. I mean that plaza I mean, is questionable. I don't know. That's my suspicion, um, because like I was there, like the beginning of May okay. for a birthday party, <laughs> um, and there, I mean, there was no one there except for the eight or so people that like we, 
seven of us walked in because all of Melissa's family was here. We went to see our foster son whose birthday it was. And, and that's where he went to celebrate. And, um, we like doubled the number of people in Chuck E. Cheese when we walked in. And so it's like, does it just like pay for itself now? Is it like you like, pay off your house and you're just like, now my house gets to like chill and be my house. Like, they, is that how but Chuck I don't e. think, but I don't think they own, that's company? the thing. I don't think they own the bill. I don't know. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I'm just like, how do you like, do they have any expenses anymore? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I feel like it might be harder to launder money now though. Cause you don't have coins. It's like cards. Mm. It's like digital. So I don't know. Maybe they're, maybe, maybe they're not laundering maybe money. Maybe crypto is like, oh, si- yeah. like silently feeding them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got to use Chuck E. Cheese was ahead of all of us the gotta, whole time. You got to use Bitcoin. Yeah, wouldn't that be funny? It's like <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese is, you know, is ahead of us. That's who runs Chuck E. Cheese. I'm gonna I don't do even so know. many Google deep dives. It, it's got to be. It's got to be like a, a corporation, but I don't know. The fact that it has stayed open that's impressive. It's yeah. it's persevered through a lot. What about you? Um, I, local restaurants, I would like to persevere um, for sure. Uh, that's just a beautiful thing. Um, I don't know if I have anything that I like question. Like I want Bradley's to stay open. That has become like, it was already our that's, spot, yeah, that's but it's spot. like, we maybe we probably, we go more, we've gone more in the last like eight months than Do you go like we, once a week. We're close. Okay. Um, Respect. like, yeah. So if it's like not dumping rain on a Saturday, there's like a 77% chance that we're there. Okay. Uh, that was a very specific number. I just, I <laughs> uh, just felt right. Um, so yeah, Bradley's needs to persevere. And, um, you know, also know. our rejection of like big name, good chain restaurants. Oh, I yeah. would say Tallahassee while we love yeah, like, like Chewy's couldn't persevere. Right. It perseveres everywhere. Thank you. But couldn't do it here. No. Meanwhile, we have like four crafty crabs. I need someone to break that down for yes, me. Yes. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying I don't understand. It's conf- it is confusing. They're also like going into all of the buffets that could not yeah, persevere. Buff- <laughs> <laughs> so, buffets you know, are... Wilderness Cafe, well, Wilderness Lodge or whatever yeah, that was on Capitol Circle. Used to be Buckhead Brewery. Seminole Wind, was that the one on uh-huh, Monroe, you uh-huh. know? So, and Crispers wasn't a buffet, but, you know. Start small, go big. I don't know. Hopefully, they'll do all right, you yeah. know, for the sake of the people <laughs> running. We need a higher power to be preserving the Tallahassee restaurant scene yes. <laughs> than is currently at play. Yes. So, again, speaking from a place of like no authority and no thoughtfulness, but it's my opinion. Jacob, what are you hoping perseveres in Tallahassee? Smoothie King? Mm, Smoothie King, I actually went the other day and it was good. It is good. Yeah. I, I went I went a couple days ago too. Um, I don't I don't have one that like I wish, but more like question, I guess. Okay. Which is all the mattress stores. And that's like <laughs> everywhere. You know, that's not just a Tallahassee <laughs> thing, but there's like two across the street from each other on Monroe. I claim I think they also are um, uh, money laundering it. schemes. Yeah. Especially as like the like you can just or like the last mattress I ordered for my day bed in my guest room, like I ordered it from Amazon and it was like one of the ones that you unroll in right. a box. Yeah. yeah. That's Thank still you. that still creeps me out. Like I don't know why <laughs> freaking like, comfortable mattress. I don't know how. I don't I'm like, how do you get such a big thing in such a tiny box like i mean i I know how they do it but it's like it's weird (laughs) just weird to me um so yeah match that that is interesting one of them closed one of the chains closed oh really? Um, Mm. yeah i forget which one mattress one maybe i don't know there's like 17 of them. <laughs> came after him. Like, Shut him down. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm curious, like how many, like I don't know, you don't change your mattress that often, so how many, like I don't know. Yeah, you're That's, supposed to change it more often than you do, but no, no one does that. Right. <laughs> like I might flip mine every eight years. I think you're supposed to change it every eight. <laughs> um, but anywho, well, uh, if you've persevered this long through the episode, <laughs> we thank you. Um, we hope you'll share it with friends. Uh, we are going to take a few week break. Uh, through the rest of July and uh, which I guess isn't really that long originally. I think originally we had like, we're going to take July off. Yeah, I think we, yeah. And then we missed some weeks. But anyways, we're going to take a couple weeks off. So uh, go back, listen to the, the oldies and uh, we'll be back ready to roll at the beginning of August. Hope to see you then. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to The Local Dive, a podcast diving into deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow The Local Dive on social media and continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at The Local Dive Pod.